Hello and welcome to this Unit 4 revision video. Now this is going to focus on two areas that you need to know about. It's going to go over some of the key things that you need to know for 4.3 economic policies and then it's also going to go through some of 4.4 and think about the workers, what their policies were towards them and what the benefits and drawbacks of their policies were. Now this is all focused on trying to help you with your next exam question. This question is going to be a source question about the workers in Nazi Germany. So you'll need to know the information that's on this PowerPoint in order to be able to do a really good job of evaluating those sources and their value for studying policies towards the workers. To begin with, it's worth trying to see what you can remember about the workers already, and you could do a quick red pen, black pen activity. This is where in one colour you'll brainstorm what you already know about Nazi economic policies, the position of workers before the Nazis came to power in the Weimar Republic, and then also thinking about what policies can you remember that they had, what were the positives and negatives of those policies. So pause the video here if you want to see what you can remember. On Wednesday the 21st of April, I would have given you a copy of the three sources so that you had the maximum amount of time to be able to annotate them and prepare for your assessment that's going to take place on Wednesday the 28th of April. Now, as I've already said before, um, it would be a very good idea to annotate those before you watch this video because this will help you be more selective as you're watching and help you think about what's actually key to write down. There's no point writing down everything in here. Instead, it would be better to regularly pause the video and then annotate your sources with the additional knowledge that you get from here. Remember, though, that I'm not just giving you a list of the answers. I'm going to talk through economic policy and policies towards the workers more generally. And then you can pick out the specific points that you're going to then use for your annotation. Now, bear in mind, not everything I say is relevant for the source question. However, it is important for giving you the kind of context and background understanding that you'll then be applying to your exam question. So it's definitely worth listening to it but you don't necessarily need to make notes on every single area. As I mentioned before, it'd be a very good idea to make sure that you have annotated these sources and read through them before you watch this video. Now, we're not just going to be writing about them generally. Everything you say has got to be linked to this question that is asking you to assess the value of these sources to a historian studying Nazi policies towards the workers in the years 1933 to 1939. So read through it and think about what kind of general points is this making? What kind of knowledge would you need to support it? And don't forget when you're annotating it with your initial thoughts, you want to make sure everything links to value. You want to think about why is the content valuable and think about how you can support that with own knowledge. You also might want to consider if there are any limitations to the value of the content. Does it misrepresent anything? Remember that limitations is not just listing what's missing. You're thinking about things that they've deliberately omitted, things that they've deliberately misrepresented. And that would then link to your points on tone and provenance as well. If they are misrepresenting things, why are they doing that? And think about the provenance of the source. So pause the video here to annotate source A if you haven't already. Next, we have source B. Same question again, same things to think about. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes about that one. And here we have source C again, but same question. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes. So we're going to now think about the information that you'll need for this exam answer. Now, some of those sources are talking about how the Nazis benefited workers. And I think what's important to begin with is thinking about the kind of context of it and thinking about what was the experience like of the workers in Weimar. So we're going to think about the Weimar golden years. Now, what I've done is I've just copied and pasted a slide from my 2.1 economy video, which talks through this. It's the same knowledge. Um, if it refers to anything else in unit two, you can ignore that. Obviously, this is just to talk to you about the industrial workers and their experience. 
Well, first of all, it does seem like there's lots of positives for the industrial workers, because first of all, the number of strikes declines in this period, um, and generally it declines as part of the, the, the Weimar period anyway. And that's really positive for the economy because it means that industrial production is able to increase, they're able to be very efficient, and it's generally seen as a positive. Now, the reason for the decreased number of strikes is because of the Weimar government system of compulsory arbitration. And this basically was when you sent in a mediator to try and solve any industrial disputes. So if the workers, for instance, were asking for a higher wage and their bosses um, were you know, declining to give them what they wanted, the idea was then that this mediator would come in and settle that dispute. Now, this was supposed to be a really fair system. However, it certainly did help the workers more than it helped the business owners. So, for instance, in 1927, generally the workers received a 9% increase in their wages, whereas the, uh, the business owners obviously wouldn't see that as a positive um, and would have seen that, that as bad for business because it would have been eaten into their profits. So the people that owned the business at this point generally complained about the system of compulsory arbitration and said that it was biased in favour of the unions, which was bad for them. Now, this kind of anger and resentment of what they found as a very socialist um, policy is really shown by an example of um, the Ruhr in 1928 when there was basically a dispute over the wages in the iron and steel industry. And that resulted in the arbitrator from the government coming in and suggesting a small wage increase for the workers. Now, this isn't for a small number of people. This was for 250,000 workers. So it would have a significant impact. And the employers actually refused to pay it and then locked out the workers from their factories, from their workplaces for four weeks. And this just kind of shows you that frustration that a lot of the business owners felt. You know, it wasn't just about the wages. It was generally about the fact that, for instance, there was supposed to be a maximum eight hour working day. All of these things are generally seen as positives, but obviously business owners wouldn't necessarily view them in the same way. So thinking about the positives for industrial workers, we've already mentioned about the wage increases, but let's think about them in a little bit more detail because you really want to be able to use some statistics in your answers. For instance, we could talk about in 1927, the fact that there was a 9% increase on top of the normal um, workers' wages. So they have substantially more buying power, substantially more purchasing power, it would be seen as a real positive. And in 1928, it increased a further 12%. That's on top of the already 9% increase that they've got. So this really did improve their standard of living, which was a real positive for those industrial working classes. However, it was only for the industrial workers. You know, the middle stand, the professional middle classes, the white collar workers in their offices and things, they didn't get those pay rises. And therefore, there starts to be some real resentment in an already divided society between the working class and the middle class, especially as the middle stand are feeling quite resentful of the fact that they're not benefiting from this economic golden age in the same way that the working classes are. So, you know, there's certainly this, this divide, but there's also other problems as well. The other problem is that unemployment continues to be an issue throughout these years. Now, the smallest number they ever get in the golden years is actually 1.3 million people unemployed and that's achieved in 1925. In 1926 it goes up to 3 million, it does decrease after that but as I mentioned it only goes down to a minimum of 1.3 million. So that's quite substantial in terms of that level of unemployment and that was down to things like public spending cuts and companies making efficiency savings to try and stay afloat as well. So industrial workers Things, you know, certainly were on the up for them. But for the business owners, there was a lot of resentment of these positive changes. And so we're having we're having a bit more of that political divide um, in society again.
So another key bit of background is to understand the impact of the Great Depression on the workers from late 1929, early 1930 onwards, and particularly before the Nazis came to power. Now, obviously, Germany was particularly hard hit by the Great Depression because of their reliance on American loans. And that meant by 1932, about one third of all German workers were registered as unemployed. It was about six million workers receiving benefits. But the uh, historians think that actually the numbers of unemployed was even higher than that. They actually think it was around 8 million by January 1933. So therefore, there were lots of people that were very desperate that wanted to turn to the government for help. But remember that the government did things like cutting unemployment pay. So lots of workers, particularly people that were farmers and white collar workers, the middle stand, they particularly supported the Nazis, but there were also some people that worked in industrial areas and some working class people that were enticed by ideas like the Nazis providing work and bread. Um, and they liked other messages of their campaigns like buy German goods. So they rely less on um, getting imports and it would help German companies as well. Now, how many working class people voted for the Nazis is something that is really debated by historians. It's very difficult to work out exactly who voted for who, because there has to be some kind of regional analysis, thinking about the types of communities and kind of what groups within those communities would likely have voted for the Nazis. There is, however, a historian called Falter, who argues that more than a quarter of National Socialist voters were workers. Um, but as I said, it's quite hotly contested by different historians. Nevertheless, when you're thinking about the policies to the workers from 1933, you want to think about the fact that these workers are sometimes quite grateful for the comparison to pre-Nazis when they were suffering from these dire economic circumstances. And obviously, don't forget, the Nazis had propaganda like this, where they said Hitler, our last hope. So now we're going to move on to thinking about economic policy and think about its impact on the German people. Now, there are lots of areas to this. There's areas about Schacht and things like how he tried to reduce unemployment. And there's also things like Goering and the four year plan. I'm only going to talk to you about the areas that I think are relevant for the background of these sources. I'm not going to talk to you about all areas in your textbook. You're more than welcome to go back through it if you want to. But I'm talking to you about the areas that I think are the most relevant um, for kind of understanding the context of the sources. So the Nazis had some clear economic aims and their policies changed over time. When they first came to power in 1933, they were very much focused on tackling the issue of unemployment. Remember that Hitler had been elected with the promise of providing work and bread and that he was going to be different to the Weimar politicians and he needed to fulfil that. So in the short term, their policy is about recovery from the Great Depression and ending unemployment. And then we'll see from 1936, they then moved on to trying to make Germany self-sufficient. So it says here what their short term priority was and also their long term aim as well. So let's think about how did the Nazis try and help Germany recover from the Great Depression? How did they stimulate economic recovery? Well, they did this in loads of different ways. They generally pumped a lot of money into the economy to do things like building homes and autobahns. And they used the National Labour Service or the RAD to do this. A historian called Evans talks about the fact that they are so publicly spending money and getting people jobs. He talks about it being one of the most durable propaganda exercises. They made sure that they made the most in propaganda of the fact that they were building Germany, making a better future for this thousand year Reich and also providing jobs for young men too. They also did things like having tax cuts too, to try and encourage people to spend more. And they even gave loans, for instance, to newly married couples as well, to encourage them to have children um, and to encourage them to spend as well. So there were lots of different things that they did to help reduce unemployment. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. So the Nazis, as we know from 1933, prioritised economic recovery and in propaganda, they called it the battle for work. And they'd said that they'd won this by 1936. So let's think a little bit more on how they do it. Now, first of all, the really key person to understand for economic recovery is Schacht, 
He was somebody that was head of the Reichsbank and then he became economics minister from 1934. It was his idea about spending so much public money to try and stimulate the economy a bit more. They did things, as we've already mentioned, like building those roads, the autobahns and public buildings of things like schools, hospitals, um, roads, loads of different things that they were doing. And remember, this was generally done under the Reich Labour Service, sometimes called the National Labour Service, exactly the same thing. You can call it either name or the RAD. And the idea was that men between the ages of 18 and 25 would do six months of compulsory labour. Whilst they're doing it, they're not going to be counted in the unemployment statistics. And it's also going to teach them about the value of hard work, practical skills and make them feel like they're part of this effective people's community. Remember that the Nazis also reduced unemployment by doing things like um, bringing in conscription in 1935 that says young men have to join the army for a set period of time. And all of that helped reduce um, the numbers of unemployed. For instance, by the start of the Second World War in 1939, there were 1 1.4 million men in the German army. So they've gained an extra 1.3 million jobs that way. And also then all those men in the army need things like uniforms and other resources, and therefore they're increasing the number of people working in factories. So generally the Nazis have done pretty well at winning the battle for work, but as we're going to see in a second, they also cheated a bit. Pause the video here if you do want to add any notes. So we've just mentioned that the Nazis cheated a bit. Essentially, in propaganda, they claimed that they had won the battle for work by 1936. They don't even mention that term again after 1936, which reflects the success of propaganda in convincing people that unemployment was no longer an issue. The efforts were generally appreciated by the workers. People felt that actually the Nazis had delivered on their promises, provided work and bread, and therefore the Nazis contrasted significantly and quite positively when compared with the Weimar governments that had had to do things like cutting unemployment pay. So what we're going to think about now is the kind of myth versus the reality. When it comes to the so-called economic miracle of the Nazis, we'll find that although they had made some positive changes for some people when it came to the economy, actually in reality, they never met their propaganda claims. So the Nazis said that they had won the battle for work and that this victory was entirely down to their policies. Let's think about the reality of it now. Well, first of all, Actually, German economic recovery was already underway by 1933 when the Nazis came to power. For instance, a lot of their job creation schemes, a lot of these ideas about building roads and hospitals and all that kind of stuff was actually based on policies that had been started by the former Chancellor Brüning. A historian called Burley points out that a lot of these projects were actually in the filing cabinets of the Weimar Republic. And actually, this isn't something that we can credit the Nazis with. They were kind of piggybacking off of um, somebody else. Also, we can think about how the Nazis cheated a lot when it came to statistics. So, for instance, they claimed that they got rid of unemployment, but they did things like pushing married women out of their jobs, pushing ordinary women um, that were single out of their jobs as well. And they were also doing things like um, pushing Jews out of their jobs and then not counting them in the unemployment statistics and also doing things like counting people that had summer jobs as being full time um, yearly round um, employed, even though that's not true. So a historian called Evans talks about how there were actually 1.5 million people in Germany that were invisibly unemployed that just weren't counted in the statistics. And this is supported by a historian called Mason, who talks about how the battle for work and the fact that they'd reduced unemployment was an optical illusion achieved by statistical manipulation. So the Nazis did have some successes with reducing unemployment, but they weren't as significant as they made out in propaganda. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes about the battle for work. The next area that you need to know a little bit about is the long term aim of autarky and how the Nazis wanted to make Germany self-sufficient. Now, remember, this is put in place because they um, know that the reason that they lost the First World War is because of the successful Allied blockade that had killed over 400,000 Germans who had died from starvation or illnesses linked to malnutrition. 
So they know that at some point the Second World War will break out. Hitler has already been breaking terms of the treaty since 1933, and he expects that war will break out probably in about 1940, 1941 or two. So they start making themselves self-sufficient from 1936. And the reason they choose this date is because that's when the so-called battle for work had been won. And now they can focus on trying to achieve a different economic objective. The person that they put in charge of this was Hermann Goering, who you can see there. He was not an expert on the economy at all. He had quite a variety of jobs in Nazi Germany, including being in charge of the Luftwaffe in the Second World War. His priorities were to try and make Germany self-sufficient by doing things like controlling labour supplies, controlling prices, controlling raw materials and doing things like setting production targets for different factories. He also tried to encourage people to become reliant only on German goods and not to get anything in from other countries, doing things like eating German food, using only German raw materials in their work. And there was a large propaganda campaign that was aimed at trying to encourage the people to support this and um, quite a nationalistic agenda. And actually, a lot of people did support it and liked the fact that they were helping the German economy. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes. Now, the four year plan isn't explicitly mentioned in any of the sources, but what we do need to understand about it is the impact on the German people. You know, these sources are all about the policies towards the German workers. And part of that is thinking about the standards of living of ordinary German citizens. And actually, the four year plan had a significant impact on those German people. And that's what we're going to think about here. So this slide is a bit more important than the last one where it just described what the four year plan was. So because the Nazis were really concerned with trying to make themselves self-sufficient, they had to choose between guns versus butter. That is a phrase that was used by Goering himself to describe the strains on the economy. If you're going to make yourself self-sufficient and make everything in Germany, you're not necessarily going to be able to make the variety of goods that you could before. And so they put the needs of the military, the guns, over the needs of the consumers, which has been represented by butter. So they do actually increase production and have some successes with it. But obviously their economy is very much focused on what's needed to be self-sufficient and to um, help them in future wars. And therefore, it's very much focused on things like rearmament. Um, they do have some issues as a result with things like food shortages, rising prices because of those shortages of goods and also some poor living conditions for ordinary Germans. And this does actually lead to some growing disillusionment with the regime. Now, they could have solved these issues by importing um, goods from other countries, but they didn't want to do this as they wanted to save that foreign currency for things like rearmament. So they did try and encourage people to um, kind of support the Nazis and support their economic policies, even though it had an impact on them. You know, they talked about it being for the wider Volksgemeinschaft, for being for the people's community. Um, and generally, people were a bit disillusioned with it, but they generally accepted it. If we think about the success of the four year plan. Well, it never actually met its propaganda claims. For instance, they were still importing a third of um, its raw materials and a third of its goods in 1939. And also, obviously, as we've already mentioned, crucially, it did place severe strains on the economy and there were some shortages of uh, different goods. So that's the impact of the four year plan. Generally, it just led to some shortages. So we've talked about um, how the Nazis kind of presented them as experiencing an economic miracle. We talked about how they said they'd won the battle for work and we thought about the reality with that. We've also thought about the four year plan, and how they said they were going to make Germany self-sufficient. But the reality was that they were actually still importing a third of their raw materials and things. The third area of the so-called Nazi economic miracle is that they said that they had raised the living standards of Germans. I'm going to look here at the kind of myth and ideas that support this idea that they improve living standards. And we're also going to think about the kind of the reality and actually how it wasn't perfect. And actually some Germans didn't experience this rise in living standards that the Nazis said they did.
So generally, just as an introduction, Nazi propaganda emphasised the need to make sacrifices on behalf of the people's community by working harder for longer hours and accepting a reduction in wages. But at the same time, they stressed that the Nazis provided lots of benefits on the German people through improved working conditions because of something called the beauty of labour that we'll come back to later, better social and welfare provision and access to services and goods that workers could not previously afford. So let's think about how things did get a bit better for ordinary Germans and their living standards. Well, first of all, the Nazis did provide various things for the German people that they might not have had access to before. For instance, the radio, the people's receiver, you know, 70% of German households own one by 1939. There's also things like the Volkswagen scheme of the people's car, although remember that they don't actually give out a single car because the outbreak of war disrupts that. But still lots of German people were buying into this monthly scheme of um, donations towards this car and it was something they were very excited about. There's also things like the cruise ship holidays as a result of the strength through joy movement that gave the impression that Germans were experiencing a rise in their standard of living. Also, despite the fact that the Nazis did try and hold down wages, incomes for many workers did increase during 1933 to 1939. That's often because some employers were prepared to pay bonuses and other benefits to get around the freeze on wages. So we did mention about the pay increased um, for a couple of reasons, and that was often as well due to the number of hours being worked was much higher now. Also, because the Nazis really prioritised rearmament and the military economy from 1936, some workers that worked in particular industries like armaments were better off than before. The Nazis saw them as a priority and therefore they benefited more than other groups of workers. And generally, if we think about the rise of living standards, you know, even though they had um, dealt with some problems that we'll go through in a second, actually the workers didn't form mass opposition, despite the fact they had to shoulder these burdens. So let's now think about the kind of worsening of living standards and what you could put for this one. So you could think about the fact that they had to work for longer hours and accept a squeeze on wages. Workers also had to give some of their money to compulsory contribution pots for the beauty of labour and the German labour front, the DAF. People that worked in industries as well that produced consumer goods were worse off because remember that they were prioritising the guns over butter and therefore consumer industries, um, a lot of them had to kind of turn and do things um, like um, producing more armaments and things like that. There were also some shortages of some key commodities because they weren't focused on producing them and most families couldn't afford luxuries at this point. We can even see the impact on living standards through food where consumption of higher value foods such as meat, fruit and eggs declined whilst the consumption of cheap food increased, for instance, things like potatoes and rye bread. And generally the Gestapo and the Sepada reports occasionally show discontent with the regime. And obviously that's interesting because the Gestapo reports are actual Nazi reports and the Sepada, remember, are the SPD in exile. And they're both kind of in, in agreement that there was some discontent. So pause the video here if you want to make any notes or annotations to your sources about the living standards of Germans. So now we're going to think more specifically about the workers and about how Nazi policies affected them. This is going to be particularly important for your source analysis. These policies towards the workers were part of the wider aim of trying to create a Volksgemeinschaft in German society. So I'm just going to talk to you very generally about what the Nazis wanted to achieve about society, not just the workers, and then we'll go into workers' policies afterwards. So first of all, the Nazis wanted to create that Volksgemeinschaft in which class differences, religious loyalties, as well as regional age and gender differences were put aside and replaced by national unity. Thinking about the history of Germany and how divided it had been throughout Weimar, they wanted to kind of break down those divides and create this um, unified society. Hitler also didn't want there to be any organisation standing between the state and the individual. He wanted everyone to become part of the mass that was working towards the same goals for Germany. Therefore, individuals would be given no space in which they could think or act independently of the regime. 
Remember that they believed anything that was acting too independently would be considered opposition. They wanted the individual submerged in the mass. They used propaganda, indoctrination, terror and repression to ensure that all people would be loyal and self-disciplined. And obviously they had gender roles that they tried to enforce as well. So the workers in the Third Reich. First of all, we want to think about why were the workers important to the Volksgemeinschaft? Now, they were really crucial because they made up 46% of society and therefore were the largest group. They were also absolutely essential for the Nazis achieving their economic aims. Their increase in armaments and production needed the workers to be on board. But traditionally, the workers weren't normally supportive of the Nazis and therefore they were a threat to this policy of Gleichschaltung or coordination because they were generally people that were linked to trade unions and generally they had voted for parties like the SPD and the KPD in the past. Therefore, the Nazis have got to try and win them round. So thinking about their aims, they want to gain their support. They want to win this crucial group over to the Volksgemeinschaft, which can't be successful with 46% of the population not supporting it. They also want to encourage them to increase production to achieve that aim of um, making Germany self-sufficient and winning the battle for work. And they also want to try and control them. They want to control everything they're doing in terms of production, what they're producing and things like their wages. And as part of that, it's about trying to make sure that they limit opposition. So they want to try and control them. And they do that by doing things like dismantling their trade unions in May 1933 as part of this early phase of consolidating their position and getting rid of political opposition. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes. The next area you've got to know about is the German Labour Front, the DAF. Now, this is something that replaces trade unions, but it is not a trade union itself. So we know that the Nazis came to power uh, when Hitler became Chancellor in January 1933. And for the first year and a half up until August 1934, they had sought to try and consolidate their position. Now, one thing that they had done in May 1933 was to ban trade unions. They'd done this for lots of different reasons, but one of them was to try and reward the business owners that had been financially supporting them in their election campaigns. They also wanted to take away the rights of workers and the power of workers through these trade unions um, that had been so essential in Weimar. In Weimar, Germany, the trade unions were some of the most powerful in Europe. And obviously the Nazis don't want them to have that kind of bargaining power and that um, status. So they replace all of the trade unions with the new German Labour Front or DAF under the leadership of a man called Ley that you can see on the right hand side. The whole point of the German Labour Front was to win the workers over to the Volksgemeinschaft and encourage them to increase production whilst limiting opposition as well. This was not a trade union, as we've mentioned already. It had no bargaining power over wages and little influence over social and economic policies. However, because the German Labour Front included things like the strength through joy movement that we'll talk about in a second, this organisation became the largest in the Third Reich, with membership rising from about 5 million in 1933 to 35 million in 1936. This wasn't compulsory, so these numbers are quite impressive. But then we also have to think about the fact that this was the only organisation for workers and Strength Through Joy was also a subsidiary part of the German Labour Front. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes on this. So we're going to think a little bit more about the German Labour Front and what it did. So first of all, this was something that was replacing the trade unions, but we know it wasn't actually one. It did, however, have its own propaganda department, and the idea was that it was to spread Nazi ideology among the working class Germans, people that weren't normally um, voted and supported the Nazis to try and create this Volksgemeinschaft. They also did a wide range of things, including providing vocational training courses to try and improve workers' skills in 1936. They also had their own large business empire that ended up paying 44,500 employees by 1939. And they also had an army of volunteers as well that weren't paid for their work. 
The German labour front, the DAF, owned its own banks, housing associations, construction companies, and even its own travel company that will make more sense in a second when we think about strength through joy. Now, we've said about how it wasn't in favour of the workers, but it was more in favour of the state. And therefore, they set workers hours and wages and they did things as well, like dealing harshly with disobedience. And they also managed the subsidiary organisations of Strength Through Joy, the KDF, and Beauty of Labour, the SDA. They forbade any strikes and they tried to outlaw any kind of collective bargaining over pay. And they also limited freedom of movement as well. For instance, a worker couldn't just leave their job and decide to go somewhere else. It had to be agreed by the state. So let's think about the German labour front and whether it improved the lives of workers. Well, workers in Nazi Germany became increasingly under pressure to work harder and accept a squeeze on wages and living standards. We can see this in the increase in the average working hours from being about 43 in 1933 to about 49 by 1939. Now, we even reached 60 by the time that we get to 1944. So a lot of people are having to deal with longer working hours for a very minimal pay rise if they even get one. However, the Nazis tried to counteract this by saying that actually the reward for working was not material gain and money, but actually the knowledge that they were serving the community and helping to build a better Germany. Now, obviously, that wasn't enough for some workers and they still felt the pressure and they still didn't like the Nazis for their policies. But they did try and give them more of a carrot approach as well through the KDF, through the Strength and Joy movement, because the Nazis knew they couldn't take them for granted and they had to provide something to keep the workers on side. Pause the video here if you need to make any other notes about the German labour front. You've already seen that the KDF, the strength through joy, was part of the German labour front, the DAF. So think about why was this set up? What well, was set up to try and organise workers' leisure time? This is because the Nazis didn't want people having any kind of freedom of thought. They wanted to submerge the individual in the mass, indoctrination through this strength through joy movement. And the idea was that it would encourage workers to see themselves as part of this people's community of the Volksgemeinschaft and not see themselves in isolation. The Nazis talked about how workers would gain strength for their work by experiencing joy in their leisure. Essentially, this would encourage them to become better workers as well, because well rested workers would be more productive when they were back in. As we've already mentioned, um, the Nazis knew that they needed something like this to provide compensation for the workers who were working long hours without much increase in wages. And it also kind of fits into part of their wider Volksgemeinschaft idea by encouraging the spirit of social equality, you know, holidays abroad being accessible to workers for the first time. They want on those holidays for people to mix and therefore to break down the social and religious divides in Germany. And there's also an element as well of them wanting to encourage people to be more active. We know that from their policies towards women, that they try to encourage um, people to be as physically active as possible. And part of the strength of joy is also trying to create that healthy society. But the main thing that you need to know for the aims is that it's about um, stopping their freedom of thought, submerging them in the mass. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes about the aims. So now let's think about what did the Strength Through Joy actually do? What were the methods that they used? So this was an organisation that provided subsidised holidays, sporting activities, hikes, theatre and cinema trips, as well at reduced prices. The idea with it was that there would be a KDF warden in every factory and every workplace that had more than 20 people working there. So let's think about some examples of what they did. Well, they took lots of ordinary Germans to places like Libya, Finland, Norway, Bulgaria and Turkey on cruises. The idea is that they were taking them here to show how superior Germans were to the inhabitants of the countries that they visited. You know, it's quite an exciting thing to go on a foreign holiday at that point, And therefore, it was going to show the Germans that they were superior to others. And this was pretty successful, as we can see by this statistic. By 1938, one third of the workforce had taken part in subsidised vacations. 
including 180,000 that had enjoyed state-sponsored cruises. And there were over 10 million holidays taken by 1938. It wasn't just cruises though, there were also rail trips that took Germans across Europe. And with these cruises, with these holidays, and with these general trips, the idea is that they would be classless and they would all be done on a one class basis to emphasize unity. They would have Gestapo and SS agents to spy on them and people would be expected to behave well. Although we're gonna see that it's often the agents of the KDF that don't. So all of this kind of stuff, all of these holidays and sporting activities, hikes and discounted trips, and things like the people's car and the people's receiver, all of this is helping to build the impression that the Germans were experiencing an unprecedented rise in living standards as a result of Nazi policies. We'll think about how true that is in a second. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes about what the strength through joy provided. When we were thinking about economic policy, we thought about how there was the economic miracle that the Nazis promoted, and we also thought about the reality and what it was actually like. We want to do the same thing for Strength Through Joy. So on the previous slide, you've got some information about the success of Strength Through Joy, but we're also going to think about the reality and the limitations to success now. So first of all, we mentioned about how this was about creating this classless society and to help the workers be able to afford these luxury holidays. But actually, in reality, the tickets were still too expensive for ordinary Germans. And for example, on one trip to Norway on a cruise, only 10% were actually from the working class. Furthermore, these weren't necessarily very successful. There were lots of reports of mass drunkenness, fights between passengers and little mixing between classes. And even people like Robert Ley, who often went on these trips, and other Nazi government officials, they were often given the best cabins, which obviously goes that, against the idea of them being classless, and they also behaved very badly. Robert Ley himself was actually one of the worst offenders. So the reality didn't necessarily match up to the propaganda claims, but it's still important to understand that overall, the KDF, the Strength Through Joy movement, was really valued by the workers and help to reconcile people, even people that were former opponents of the regime, um, to actually support the Nazis, or at least not oppose them. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes about the impact of strength through joy. Another area you need to know about is the beauty of labour movement, the SDA. Now this again is part of the German Labour Front, the DAF, and part of this is about trying to get workers to work harder, but it's also about improving conditions in the workplace. The Nazis, remember, are very obsessed with trying to make sure that the population is very healthy. Um, they think that's really important for the future of German society. And so part of this, just like the KDF, involves encouraging sports and building sports facilities. They also are doing things as well, like campaigning for more nourishing hot meals and canteens, again, to try and help the population be more healthy, but also encourage those workers to work harder and be more efficient. The regime got these people to pay for these improvements themselves. So the employers and their workers would have to do the work in their spare time and the workers would have to make um, involuntary contributions from their wages. If you didn't volunteer and give some money for the beauty of labour movement, you could be threatened with dismissal or worse. Now, with this money, um, they actually did improve a lot of workplaces. And by 1938, 34,000 workplaces had been improved. But it wasn't particularly popular with the workers because obviously they resented the fact they had to do this in their own time and pay for it. And some of them felt that these improvements weren't necessary. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes about the beauty of labour. When we studied the workers in lessons, we made a table about how the Nazis um, helped the workers and how they made them worse off as well. Now, these are all the points that we came up with. It's definitely worth pausing the video here in a second and writing some of these down if you haven't got them already. Most of these have been covered over the last few slides. But there are a few things that are new that are worth putting down. For instance, things like this that I've just highlighted there. So pause the video here and make some notes if you need to about how much the workers actually benefited.
If we're thinking about how successful the Nazis were with the workers, it's definitely worth considering to what extent did they deal with opposition from the workers. And so this comes from Unit 4.2. So thinking about the workers, we've already mentioned that they were 46% of the population and generally they were linked to parties like the SPD and the KPD. But it's quite shocking how successful the Nazis were at controlling the workers from 1933. And actually union resistance crumbled surprisingly quickly after many of the leaders had been arrested um, early on in 1933. Now, generally, the workers had many causes for complaint, but they had few outlets to express their discontent and no independent organisation to press their case. Obviously, the Nazis had taken away their powerful trade unions and replaced them with something that meant they couldn't actually bargain for better conditions. Even though they couldn't really go on many strikes and things because these were now illegal, there were other ways in which workers could show that they were dissatisfied with the Nazis. Generally, they could do things like withdrawing their labour by going on strike. And there were actually 250 strikes that were recorded in 1937. Or they could quit, even though that was illegal. Or they could do things like not being very productive or being absent a lot. Now, the Nazis did actually deal with increased absenteeism, which reflects the fact that some of the workers weren't very happy with the Nazi state. And we can see how important this was, because in 1938, the Nazis actually had to introduce new regulations to enforce penalties against slackers and for people that were absent. So it shows you the scale they must have been dealing with if they felt it was necessary to then introduce those regulations. However, it is important to note that when there was opposition from the workers by doing things like not working productively or being absent, it was generally over discontent with the working and living conditions and standards rather than an outright strike against the dislike of the Nazis. So it wasn't like they formed really serious opposition. Pause the video here if you want to make any notes about how successful their policies were. Generally, historians are quite uncertain about the reaction of the working classes to the Nazi dictatorship. That's because the German working class is a large and diverse social group and its response to something like a totalitarian dictatorship is not easy to gauge. Just like it's very difficult to even know about actually how many workers voted for the Nazis in the 1932 elections. Nevertheless, even though it's difficult to find out exactly how the workers felt, we do know that organisations like the KDF were generally pretty popular. That's because they offered opportunities to the workers and gave them a means of escaping boredom and even helped reconcile some former opponents to the regime. Generally, historians think that large sections of the working classes were either converted or reconciled to the dictatorship. For example, Puker talks about how there was at least a basic general consent to the regime, or at least a passive adjustment to the Nazi situation and the fact that they couldn't change it. However, just because people generally um, didn't oppose the Nazis doesn't mean that they shared the Nazis' ideological aims. And there is also some evidence that their discontent was increasing, despite the fact that there wasn't much industrial action against the Nazis. So overall, in terms of how successful the Nazi policies towards the workers, it is quite difficult to gauge you know, isolating the workers from the rest of the dictatorship is very difficult. And obviously things like the terror state and propaganda all come into play with why there was limited opposition from the workers. But we don't want to necessarily see that they were, um, you know, real opponents of the regime. There were actually many that were reconciled to the regime by the providing of jobs, winning the battle for work, and also because of things like the KDF. Pause the video if you want to make any notes. Thinking about the success with the workers is part of a wider question of thinking about to what extent did the Nazis achieved the kind of social revolution in Germany that they desired between when they first came to power and when they lost power too. So there's just a few points about this here. You don't need to make any notes on it for your source question, but it might be worth just having a quick read. Hopefully you've been annotating your sources with the extra information from this PowerPoint as you've been going along.
if you just listened to it and you hadn't actually been stopping it to make notes, it's definitely worth now going back over it again. You could even turn the sound off and just use the information on the PowerPoint to add some extra contextual knowledge around all three sources that will help you get to those grade A's and B's that you all want. There's also on Teams, if you do want it, a chance test that has 19 questions on just the workers. You could use that to make sure that you know the key information before you go into the exam.